Yes, yes. Welcome to Bite Size B2B Marketing, where our aim is to give B2B companies easy to digest tips to help improve their marketing efforts. I am joined by the one and the only Ryan Stewart, and I've always enjoyed his no-nonsense approach, gets results which he openly shares, and talks about what works and what doesn't. He's the managing partner at Webris, their legal marketing experts, managing partner at the Blueprint Training, which helps SEO agencies grow, and we've been a proud member of this for many, many years. And finally, managing partner at Ryan Stewart Consulting at Disney Van. So it's my great pleasure to have him on the podcast. Welcome, Ryan. How is it yeah, going? Thanks for having me. No problem at all. No problem. Appreciate you for doing this. And uh, today, yeah, as I mentioned, we'll have a, a wide reaching conversation, I'm sure. But one area I did want to focus on was positioning and niching down. You've always been a big proponent of this through the Blueprint training program where you've recommended to us and also other companies focus in on helping a specific customer with a specific problem. And a good place to start is looking at the progression of Webris. I checked recently researching this episode and your position as the legal marketing experts. And I know this was something you ranked for really well before a topic that you were appearing high in the search results, but why the full reposition to focus in on this and what are the benefits that you've seen? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. So just kind of a brief, a longer history of how we arrived here too. I have been offering marketing, specifically SEO services for over 10 years now. And when we first got started doing this, SEO was in incredibly high demand and it was also incredibly impactful of a service in terms of the ROI. You know, you rank first for a term 10 years ago and you were printing your own money, quite literally. <laughs> Over time, <clears throat> the emergence of other platforms, the noise in Google search, right? You search for, I don't know, buying white sneakers and you've got ads, you've got carousels, you've got all sorts of nonsense, right? So. The ROI, and I also think the demand has gone down as there's been other emerging platforms, which essentially means what was once a no brainer shoot fish in a barrel type offer has dramatically reduced. And I think that a lot of people in the SEO industry refuse to acknowledge that they just refuse. Yeah. They think that yeah. SEO is still, they, they like pull up a trend, a Google trends chart and be like, more people are looking for SEO. So therefore it's going up, which might be the case because more and more access to starting entrepreneurs, Shopify, you know, like ability to build, just ability to launch a business is dramatically increased as well. And what's the first thing that people, small business owners, first time entrepreneurs think is like, oh, like if I rank in Google and I do SEO, yeah. then I'll make more money. So what's happened is that there's a log jam at the bottom of the market in terms of just massive amounts of interest in it, because off first rip, you have a website you want to rank in Google, but those of us who are honest with ourselves and our business people first, not SEOs first, because I didn't get into SEO because I love Google, but the opposite, I just got in here because I wanted to make money. Yeah. So I look at all of this really as what's the best way for me to keep providing for my family, for my team, and for my clients. And so tying into that vein, right, means that you constantly have to be looking at your market, right? And you have to be looking at your service and your offer. So we've gone through multiple iterations, like most great agencies do over time, right? Like mm -hmm. if you're not consistently looking at your product, just like any company, right? If you make hats, for example, or whatever that may be, or you're constantly looking at your product and trying to improve it over time. It's the same thing with a service-based business, if not tenfold with how fast the market is changing and how many emerging platforms and new opportunities and AI coming in now too, it's, it, mm -hmm. it really makes makes things challenging if you stay stagnant, if you're still doing things the same way you were doing 10 years ago. Why so many SEO agencies struggle and why the Blueprint Training does so well, because so many SEO agencies very much so struggle with the business side of things, if you if you will. So yeah. we arrived at law firms after going through B2B SaaS, after going through, and it's not that we didn't have success there. It's more of, again, looking at the market. When I look at B2B SaaS, it's a very popular niche that people want to dive into because they look at the overall purchasing power and the overall education of the market, right? Everyone who's in SaaS understands SEO. So you mm -hmm. don't have to go through like, this is how Google's grown over the years. This is the process, they know that, right? But the challenge with that also is when you're selling to a very educated consumer base in the B2B SaaS space, their level of expectations for the service you have to provide are very high, <laughs> yeah. right? They yeah. usually have an internal marketing manager who knows SEO probably just as well as you do, and it's very heavily reliant on the content that you have to create long form, in depth, well-researched 
from an operational point of view, that's very difficult to do, especially at scale. It's difficult to manage those types of clients. There's a downward pressure consistently on content in terms of pricing and what people are willing to pay. Yeah. And then also just the nature of it, to me, this is the most important part of search. If you really want to sell SEO is if you go to Google and you type in what that main keyword is, does the action most likely result in some sort of conversion? Hmm. So when we look at B2B SaaS as an example, the answer is overwhelmingly, no, it doesn't because you type in best CRMs, you get G2 crowds, you get the comparison websites, then you get like the long blog posts on Forbes, right? There's, there's no real conversion intent in that bottom funnel keyword. So what's left is just this part of my French is farting out of content <laughs> and yeah. agency yeah. that doesn't have conversion value. It's, it's too top funnel. It's not, it's not, it doesn't have enough teeth, which especially we'll talk about AI becomes a massive problem when AI commoditizes content yeah. because now you're getting paid for something that doesn't have business value. And that's the core part of this whole thing about positioning, this whole thing about, you know, offers and all that it's, we're here to make people money. And somewhere along the line, the SEO industry lost sight of that because when times are good, industries get fat and bloated. And this industry mm. is fat and bloated. There's so many different ways of selling. There's links, there's content, there's keywords, there's, so there's all this different stuff. The industry lost sight of what we're here for. And that's marketing is to get people more customers. So the core question that you have to ask yourself again is, does this search result in a conversion? And if it does, then you still got a great offer. You still got a great business, but that's where positioning comes into place. And that's why we decided to really focus in on law firms, because for the time being, anyways, when somebody goes to Google and searches for law firm near me or immigration attorney, it still results in a phone call, right? Yeah. Directly yeah. off of that click. Same thing with like home services. Oh, well, well, that's why those are very good industries for search. And again, especially as AI comes in and commoditizes the market and cannibalizes more and more of search engine real estate, if you are not driving business value for your clients, you will always be making it much harder for yourself. And that's really the core crux of why so many SEO agencies struggle because they're selling yeah. a commodity to a market that doesn't really want it anymore, but we've lied to ourselves and we're in these Twitter chats and communities and we all just hype each other up and we're not honest with each other that this is a dying service. <laughs> it really yeah. is, right? And it's still valid for certain industries, but most it's not. Like if you're a gym, if you're, coffee shop, even if you're an e-commerce store, like I would never invest in SEO ever until yeah. I've reached that point of where branded search is so high because of the demand for our product that we've created, then you can start doing SEO as kind of an ancillary secondary service. But I would never, if I'm launching a brand, SEO is at the bottom, Yeah, you know, unless I'm like a home service contractor or again, one of these industries where search is directly tied to a conversion. So that's kind of the crux of how we landed at law firms. And then you start factoring other things like, yeah. you know, law firms have money and the cost of yeah. that conversion to them or the value of that conversion to them gives us elasticity in what we can charge as an agency. Most of our clients, they get one client a year, they make a couple million bucks off it so they can pay us a hundred grand for the year. It's not a problem, you know? Yeah. But again, if you're, so there's, there's levels to like selecting a niche in a vertical I call it like the Facebook group way because a lot of Facebook groups are like, yeah, pick a niche, but they don't really go into, again, kind of the, yeah. the dynamics of what the, the, the selection process. It's very deep and very important. And if you select the wrong one, then again, yeah. you're always going to be making it harder for yourself. Always, period. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. It is a big decision. And a lot of people do just say, yeah, pick a niche. That's it. Done. And you're kind of like, okay, but what's the justification for it? What's the yeah. look years ahead? Like, is this something that is needed? What's the trend look like? And it could all change. So yeah, it's definitely a key thing. And it was something that we've been thinking a lot as an agency and even speaking the other day to Ram Fishkin, he was saying he couldn't believe how blinkered he was about SEO in the years past and how focused on it was and ignored all this other ways of helping people. And, and in terms of the process, when you thought, okay, we want to focus down on lawyers was it a gradual transition over from one to the other or has it been a fairly kind of like that's it we're all in on it update change the website great question inside of the blueprint training this is something that probably one of the most asked questions because after we go through the training and the workbooks that we have inside the blueprint to help people to focus in on the who is the first part right that we call that market yeah. position so we're talking about law firms the what is the offer which is probably more important which we'll probably talk about in a moment but what I tell people all the time is that you don't have to like, there's a lot of things that are dramatically overvalued, I think in our industry. Yeah. One of those is the website, 
Websites yeah. are obviously incredibly important because that's where the final touch point in terms of conversion happens. But like most people don't come to your website until they're already pretty far down in the funnel, right? A lot of the education is happening off website, social media, video content, ads, landing pages, communities, whatever, right? So they're on your website when they're probably already pretty educated about mm. who you are and what they want from you, right? So where I'm going with this is that you don't have to overhaul like your whole brand, right? You're like your whole public facing brand. If you're a generalist or you want to get off of working with a certain industry that's just getting crushed right now, you don't have to go through this whole like rebranding experience. We have it. So if you go to our website, webers.org, you'll still see our traditional SEO website. We, we yeah. kind of pioneered a productized service model that we call SEO sprints. We still get a lot of demand in leads through our root website. So we let leave it. But then we built a subdomain law.webers.org that's purely targeted towards law firms. And the beautiful part about once you understand marketing and understand like that there's multiple ways to do it and it doesn't have to be just creating a bunch of content and trying to rank and search. We're very good with paid traffic, very, very, very specific, yeah. strategic with paid traffic. And when you master that skill set and you really bring it in house, it gives you ability to test, right? So we were testing different offers with different messaging to different verticals. One of them was B2B SaaS. Terrible. <laughs> Just because of the, again, like I was like, the, just the sales process was a nightmare. Like they're always in budget crunch. And it, it was just like, you, you were like, when you go work for us with a SaaS company as an agency, you almost work for them as an employee because they're like cascading work down to you, yeah. which is a right at the bottom, right? Like that's a whole nother conversation when it comes to offers is that like, you want to be focused on the outcome that you drive, not the actual time of your work. And that's another mistake so many agencies make is they're like, yeah, we're going to give you 20 hours a month. And then it's like, okay, cool. You give us 20 hours a month. Like we're going to give you 20 hours of work every month. Not a position you want to be in. You want to be focused on the outcome and the value that you create and then pricing against it, right? So, so with the ability to use paid traffic, we basically just set up a, a couple of videos, a couple of ad videos, and then a couple of landing pages and click funnels. And, and we're testing different markets. Home service is another good one that we're probably going to start scaling up. So like right now we're focused on law firms and that's kind of where we're pushing most of our chips into because for the last eight months, we've had a tremendous amount of success understanding the market, understanding the customers, understanding the sales process, right? Like what do they care about? How do they communicate? What are their objections up front? We've gotten very, very good at mastering that. So I'm hiring a salesperson to base. We're basically just spinning off kind of different arms of the business that all fall under the umbrella brand, right? And I mean, we already make more money off law firms than we do off the, the normal book of business, but excuse me, the way that like we're positioning ourselves and kind of the big pitch that I give law firms is that, and this kind of ties on the offer stuff is that we don't do SEO. We're here to make you money. We're here to get you more customers, get you more leads or get you more phone, whatever they care about. Right. And it's really more clients is what they care about. You know, home service is more about leads and phone calls, but like you have to be very specific with the language that you're using. Right. So law firms care about clients and they care about, they don't want a hundred phone calls a month. They just want X number of clients per month, right? And they don't want to be wasting time because they don't have sales reps taking all these random phone calls. So we really dialed that in and we're spinning that off as kind of like its own, again, kind of like arm within the, within the brand, right? But what I tell them all the time is that like we're, we do search right now because that's the best way to get you more clients. But a year from now, you can trust us that we're going to be doing all the work for you. We're going to be reviewing all the data in the market and we're going to always be put, putting our, you and our clients in the best position. That's why we go month to month because two months from now, if Bard comes out and totally crashes the search market, which it might, we don't know, then we've got another bolt in the chamber that we're going to sell to them. Yeah. We're always focused on what the best way to acquire customers is. And when you look at an agency through that lens, as opposed to S like we do SEO and you die on that floods on, on that sword, like so many agencies will, and so many consultants will, that's why the market is fat. It's, it's going to get eviscerated in the next couple of years. If you're focused on making your clients more money, then that's then you're always going to have a job. Aside from the thing that came to be there, like when you're thinking of hiring then, are you looking for good all-round marketers who can help you with these? Or is it like a, you still have that paid ads expert, still have an SEO expert and hire on that merit? Yeah, good question. So so we've, it's like kind of a fun story about it. It's not really a fun story. Maybe, I don't know, <laughs> depending on how, how people take it, but we we basically subcontract all of our people. So they work for us full-time. That's going to be my question. Yeah. Because... You know, I, I've been on this tip for a while. I've been remote for eight years before remote yeah. was acceptable or like back in the cool. day, like we had to like not, we had to like a conscious effort internally to be like, yo, like tell everyone that we're in Miami because 
back then people were like, oh, whoa, like you don't have a local office, like you're not a real business. And then now people after COVID are like, okay, this is actually probably a better way to operate and this is how people yeah. want to operate. So my just hypothesis about where the market is going is that it's really, really hard to retain and find top talent in the marketing space because they're always in demand. Like somebody like myself with my skill set before I started doing the agency stuff, I was just jumping around on contract to contract, getting more and more every time, right? And mm -hmm. like, as an operator, you can't build a business like that. You can't build a business when people are just constantly churning out. Like it's the worst thing that can happen. You just sign a top tier client and like your best person is gone. And like, yeah. then you're fucked. Who's taking that? Who's taking that work? You. So I was kind of conscious about this earlier and building a team of people that works the way that I want to work, which mm -hmm. is freedom and getting paid, to, getting paid top dollar, right? So the way that our structure works is that we do have dedicated people that are dedicated to one thing. We have a content person, we have an SEO person, I have my director of operations. And then we got like a whole bunch of people that just kind of do like copywriters, designers that we just call on. And we basically are just selling the work and then subcontracting it out. And again, we're comfortable operating that way because it's just so much better as a business to operate that way in terms of like dealing with like W-2s and insurance and all that stuff. Like I, I just, it's my hypothesis that the, the market for good talent is more like I can make more money on my own and there's plenty yeah. of work to go around now. So why would I ever go work for a fucking agency that's going to bury me in 80 hours of work a week and like lock me down when, and then you just build a relationship with these people and that's kind of how I operate. So like I, the people that have worked for me have worked for me for like six years and more because yeah. I pay them, because I incentivize them, because I give them the freedom, unlimited time, like all that. So I don't care where you are, what you do, like you got a job to do, just do it. And I don't care when, when you work, what color, like it doesn't matter to me, you know? So yeah. we moved to that model a while ago and it works very well for us, especially me. Like I said, a, a lot of in this business too, people get stuck looking at other agencies and thinking that they have to build their business that way. I came up in the big agency world. I used to work at Deloitte, Accenture, Sapient Nitro, big traditional agencies, but yeah. like, yo, it was a terrible way to operate because every quarter they would do layoffs <laughs> because yeah. they lose a big contract and they were cutting people off, cutting their livelihood. And I was like, this is terrible. Like, I don't want to operate a business like this. Like, it's disgusting. It really is like, this is disgusting. So I moved to this model early on based on the way on my goals and what I wanted to do. And I, like I told you, I got in this business making money. I want to make as much money as I can by doing as little work as possible. And I want yeah. my team to feel that energy too. So I don't know. I'm a big believer in energy and what you put out attracts the people. And, you know, so I, I've been very lucky and successful that you know, I'm also creating a lot of content so people see it and people yeah. will come to me and be like, yo, I want to work with you. Like, you know, yeah. like I want to build with you. I want to, you know, so we just hired a new paid search guy that, you know, hit me up and he was like, I, I see what you're doing with paid search. I can be a huge asset to your team. This is what I'll charge you per account. And I'm like, boom, you're hired, done. And yeah. now I'll let him build his own book of business with us, you know? So, and that allows him to build, it, it's just, it's just a different operating model. I think we're coming to a different environment. And I think that like the freelancer contractor economy especially in this space is going to, is the future, you know, like yeah. the concept of a W2 and like, it just doesn't make sense to the owner generation. It didn't make sense to me for a while. I'm like, you're going to like, why am I, I'm giving you all my entire life, my entire time and energy for you to tell me how much I'm worth and how much I can make. Like, no, I want to do my own things. And then I think yeah. a lot of top talent things that way too. They're like, I want to build something outside. I'm like, go, please. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I don't give a shit. <laughs> yeah. Do what you want to do, like get your money, you know? So to answer your question, yes, we do. That was a very long-winded answer. No, no, like, no, no. It was, it was a good one. It was a good one. So I, I look at myself too as a value proposition for my consulting company, Ryan Sir Consulting. Like the big pitch that I have is like, you know, I'm a landing spot. Whatever you need, I got. I have a network full of people. Yeah. No matter, I made one post on LinkedIn and I got like 10 applications from amazing people for whatever you need. You need a sales rep, you need an email person, you need a copyright. Like, what do you want? I got you, you know? So like yeah. people now look at me. And they pay me 20, 25,000 bucks a month to basically just assemble them people, you know, that like they can cut off whenever they want and they don't have to deal with, you know, the, the ever changing. It's, it's just like, it's tough. People are getting tougher and tougher to manage in today's climate. So yeah. to me, that's just an easier operational model and it's beneficial to both sides of the party. Like the people are going to make yeah. more and handle their own insurance. It's, insurance is like crazy expensive anyways in the States. So it's like, we can pay for it as a company, but you're still gonna be paying 500 bucks a month, or okay. you can make an extra thousand dollars, you know, and pay for your own insurance and handle it yourself. And I think that that's just the way the market's moving in my opinion, especially in the States. So, yeah, I'm surprised that a lot more companies aren't doing it in-house as well. We're hiring an SEO expert and then they'll go through the long process of hiring an SEO expert and bringing it in rather than trying to get as far as they can themselves. And I think that was the beauty about the blueprint. It was like, 
break it down into all of these repeatable, easily teachable actions that we do as a company. And then you just need to find someone, train them up on the training you've already done, get them into the process. If they leave, fine, we find someone else, bring them in, they train them up on that or, or hire someone who's a, who has a skill in that. And I think the, the emergence of AI as well will be if you find something where it can replace a person with that, for example, overlaying the text on, on video images, if you could do that rather than hiring a person to do it, then it's like, well, you're going to use the automated version to do that. And then again, that kind of replaces someone else's job and that frees them up to do something more worthwhile or you have that less overhead. So hundred percent. Yeah. It's also a huge benefit of working with the same type of client over and over again, because like, yeah, you know, it's attorney SEO is very competitive <laughs> them versus other people. But when that's all you're doing, it's super easy, man. Like it's yeah. not complicated. Especially when it's the same, like every website, it's easier to sell, it's easier to deliver, it's easier to manage, it's easier to get results, it's easier to staff, our margins are better, the clients, it's just like top to bottom when you focus on just solving one problem for one type of client and then you land and you grow from there, yeah. as opposed to being a jack of all trades and a master of none, you're doing SEO for like an e comp shop, which is heavily technical, then you're doing it for a SaaS company, which is heavily content based, and you're doing it for yeah. a local business, and it's just all over the place. And like people wonder why they struggle and fail because. They just don't have the discipline to be like, no, this is the direction that I want to go. Maybe discipline's not the way we're right where maybe it's confidence. But again, that's why we exist the blueprint. I saw this void six years ago when we got into business and I was like, yo, like there's no real business coaching for people who learn this skill set. Cause you learn SEO on the internet, you know, yeah. you don't have yeah. any business skill set. Like people are coming from like working at a bar to like learning SEO and it's great. It's amazing. That's one of the best things about like the internet over the last 10 years is the ability to to change your life by learning a, a valuable skill, right? But like, that doesn't mean you have business sense. And that's something that you have to either learn by going through or you have to pay for people to teach, to, to learn, you know? Cause yeah. they don't teach that on YouTube. They're talking about keyword research and stuff like that. They're not talking about margins and operations and managing people and all this other stuff that makes the business. Cause in, in all fairness, like SEO is not hard to do. Anybody can learn it. Yeah. And now a lot of people know it. And the ones that make it are the ones that understand the nuances of the market, how to run a business and how to manage clients because it's about them, right? Getting results for clients. Exactly. And then moving on, changing topic and moving over to your content strategy. I saw you speak about that on LinkedIn where you were saying how you produce content. So for example, you would sit down once a week with your business partner at Webris, pick off an issue that a law firm has with their marketing sales or technology. And then you would just film you to having a discussion about that issue. And how are you coming up with that like list of problems that your customers has to then create that content from? And secondly, how are you prioritizing them? How do you know which ones are like, all right, we need to produce this one first rather than yeah. in six weeks? So step one is like not overthinking, right? Because yeah. the name of the game right now and going forward again, especially as AI comes in and just puts another rocket up content's ass that like, it's about consistency and it's about quantity and quality obviously as well. But like, it's just my opinion anything in life like if you own a restaurant you should serve good food that's like a baseline if yeah. you're going to do content it can be good content right like don't put out garbage but that that comes with practice that comes with time that comes with skill but really the things that are important are, are consistency doing it on a regular basis and the quantity of it right like not once a month or twice a, twice a year but like once a week twice a week three times the most that you can do the better right yeah so number one is just kind of like letting go of that like judgment that fear that all that stuff and just being like f it we're going to do it right that's part and that's probably the most important part because that's why uh, like every, this, the strategy that I do isn't unique. It's, it's not difficult, yeah. but execution is the name of the game. And that's also why I'm not worried about AI because I look around and I'm like, even if AI takes over and it's still easy to write content, like it's still going to take somebody to do it. And yeah. like people are inherently not going to do it. I just know people I've been doing this long enough. But anyway, so, so that's number one. Number two is sales. Just listen to what they're talking about. Listen to their objections you know, what other agencies are telling them, what they care about, what they're hearing, right? They're like, oh, I heard this. You know, I saw this from somebody. We take that and turn it into topic. So, and then three is just like, just knowing. I just know, I've just been doing this long enough now where like, I, I, I know. And then four is, I would say like more news, cutting edge things that are on the trending cusp. So there was one that we did about AI, about this, there's this like a robot lawyer called Do Not Pay. It made a bunch of headlines. So we'll like scrape headlines and push that into and kind of provide commentary on top of that. So between those four things, but I think especially like number one is sales. Number two is like your intimate knowledge. So basically we have a list that we brainstorm in Notion and just 15 minutes before we jump on the call, we just get on a Zoom call together. We'll both take notes on the side. So we'll come up with like a 
take a bunch of notes on it and then we'll just rap about it on the call. Then we have video editors that edit it, turn it into a YouTube video podcast. And I pass it to a writer to write to a blog post sometimes depending. But like, notice what I didn't put in here is keyword research. Cause yeah. to me, keyword <laughs> research is not like, it just creates bland content because it's looking at data that everyone has access to and that everyone is looking at. So it's like, if you want to do a guide to like keyword research for lawyers, go for it. But like, you're not going to make any money with that topic, <laughs> yeah. you know? So to me, a little bit more on the social side is where the content for me skews, especially with the way algorithms work. Like people aren't going to, people aren't going to YouTube as much as people think you're talking like, how do you keyword research for lawyers? Like sometimes, sure. But to me, the ones that, if you really look at people that like crushed on YouTube and social, it's people that understand like topics that are going to get people to click right away, you know, based on whatever city tactics you want to use. But yeah, but yeah that's pretty much it. Nice. And this might be the most genius thing I've seen all week and hopefully we can talk about it. And if not, I'll cut it out. Yeah. But I saw that you had the second LinkedIn profile. So you had the Ryan Stewart profile and the Ryan M Stewart, the one that was the latter one targeting the law industry. How's that been working? How's it? Cause obviously it makes so much sense, but I just wanted to know how has it been paying off? Uh, it's, it's just a resource thing. Like, so I did it because my LinkedIn profile now it's just performs very well in kind of like the marketing industry. So. Yeah. This kind of ties into a niche thing, right? Is that like the way that you stand out in a crowded marketplace is by actually going smaller and more niche, right? Yeah. So LinkedIn is a place that's become very crowded in the past couple of years, especially mm -hmm. with big marketers. We know what it is, telling stories, blah, 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 et cetera. Um, um, <laughs> I think what I want. Um, so the way that you kind of get ahead of the algorithm is by just creating niche specific content with a niche specific profile. That's just kind nice. of my hypothesis. So. So I don't dedicate any time to it. I did for a minute because I was going to roll back into the blueprint, but basically what I'm working on the next hire that I'm working on bringing in is kind of, I hate the term like growth hacker, but somebody who understands kind of content at a growth level yeah. and like can write copy and kind of manage it. So that is my plan is to kind of push life into that, but you, you just have to post daily, manage daily, post daily, join some groups, comment, comment on other people's stuff. It's just a time thing. It's like, it's, it's not worth my time to do that anymore. But I'm working on finding somebody who can do that because LinkedIn is an incredibly powerful place. And we actually did close a client from that because I push all the content to our LinkedIn page. Excuse me, then I reshare it from that page and then I'll write some, you know, copy on top of it. And I think another important part about the content conversation is that when you are focused on a niche, right? So like we changed all of our social profiles at Webers to targeting law firms, right? Yeah. Including the YouTube channel. 300 subscribers. We get like 50 to 200 views per video. It's, it's not much. But when that content is built for a specific type of person, law firms, and it's targeting very specific problems that they have, it converts much better. And again, yeah. that's why we're here, man. We're here to make money. We're not here to get views. We're not here to sell sponsorships. Like that's, that's not what we do here in B2B. Like, so people get frustrated or underwhelmed by the amount of views that they get, but it's like, you're getting 300 views on a video that's talking only to law firms or only to yeah. contractors or only to agencies. The quality of that view is so much better, man. It's so much better. So we do the same thing at Blueprint. We have a dedicated channel and socials for all that stuff. And agencies are super easy to target. Yeah. And there's limitless things to talk about with agencies too. So and it's also what I do on a daily basis. So, you know, it's very easy to come up with content for, for agencies because it's literally almost like a, just a daily blog of what I go through on, on a, on a regular basis, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. I think you saw you retweet the other day as well, where it was the screenshot of someone's profile where he was like helping fence installers or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was just the prime example of like very specific customer helps me with a very specific solution yeah it was, and it, it was Rand fishkin uh, and okay, i tweeted fair. for a reason almost being facetious because i've been saying this for years <laughs> for <laughs> years. <laughs> but of course when Rand says it you know everyone listen Rand's a great paid dude he's obviously a brilliant marketer and business yeah. as well but yeah i kind of retweeted it to be facetious because i've been like saying i told you all motherfuckers <laughs> yeah well, we've got it on the record that you were first so there we go so it's all no, i mean I, look i didn't i didn't i didn't make it up right and other people have talked about it before me i i, I don't claim to have made it up but like it's just for whatever reason, agencies have a tough time accepting that advice. A very tough time. The, I yeah. mean, dude, the amount of objections. Oh, like, well, I have current clients. I'm going to cut myself off the legs. It's like, no, guys and gals, whatever. This is tried and true business advice. Like, this is not about what you think, right? <laughs> like, yeah. Take advice from people who have made a lot more money in this than you have. Like, this is the right way to go. And sure, you can dip your toe in the water if you want, but like, just do it. Just take the advice and do it. So for whatever reason, the agencies really struggle with that advice. So that was kind of why I was 
being facetious about it because like, okay, Rand said it, now you guys can finally. You know, now you can you finally take it on board. So, <laughs> yeah. I think it's helped a little bit by the emergence of some influencers on LinkedIn who speak very specifically about certain topics or certain industries because the people are seeing firsthand that, okay, there is power by talking about the same thing over and over again to the same customer and those audiences and people are seeing it firsthand on LinkedIn. It's a bit more visual and you can be like, okay, people yeah. are having success by niching down. So. Absolutely. And in terms of, in one of the previous videos, you'd said creating content isn't enough. You need to have that ecosystem. You need to be able to push content out to people. I think that's one of the things I've always admired about your work is you've had that strong community. You had a passionate set of followers. So I think two sides to this, like, how did you build that? And then secondly, do you have any tips for companies or people starting out to try and build this community or fan base? Yes. And this is actually... <laughs> probably can open up a small can of worms because I actually feel like this is the most important thing that B2B companies can focus on right now. Yeah. Community and following. Reason being, flash forward, just take what we know right now about AI and content and flash forward three, five years from now. I just don't see people using search or like following brand accounts to get information about stuff. Again, look at something like software, right? It's like, I'm a financial accountant. I need, I'm looking at a CRM. Like I go to Google and I type it in and it's like, where's this information coming from now? Like, how's it being validated? You know, I, I guess you could kind of ask yourself the same thing now, but we're just so used to using Google. Maybe this will be the same effect. But the point I'm trying to make is that like the content is going to be so heavily commoditized and basically saying a lot of the same stuff that people, there's going to, in my opinion, there's going to be a return back to humans. There's going to be a return back to creative. There's going to be a return back to handmade stuff. There's going to be a return back to things being done the long way when it impacts the business the right way. Things like video yeah. editing and stuff, no, I mean, whatever, it's fine. But I think when it comes to like top funnel, mid funnel discovery recommendations, it's going to come from people, right? Like people will trust me to recommend them stuff up for agencies because I do it every single day. And I also don't really have a vested interest in anything aside from my own companies, right? And I think that the like in order to get to that level you have to have a following you have to have a, some sort of community element right so we've been investing heavily into building we have a facebook group that's free it's kind of like our marketing group i'll do like a monthly live in there you know some light chatter but the goal there is to just get people into something kind of like a new email list if you will mm -hmm. just to get people in a place where they can network engage we have kind of like inside sales people in there chatting them about our programs then we also have a pro slack community that's a, a monthly subscription to be in there which is a really great community and then we've got our trainings, our email lists, you know, all that different stuff. So I look at it kind of like you would look at an archery target, right? Bullseye and then going out, out of rooms. Like to me in the future, right? In order to move people to becoming a customer, like right now you can go on Facebook, target people, you know, and, you, and we can generate customers that way. But again, I just think that like people are going to be very much so like everything is going to be so much easier to launch that it's going to be so heavily commoditized that like. It's kind of like with banner ads now. You get media blindness. Like you go onto ESPN.com, yeah. you don't see the banner ads up there. You just don't notice them because it's so heavily commoditized, right? I think it'll be the same thing with a lot of ads, with a lot of content that like content is going to be so easy to produce that people are just going to stop paying attention to it, right? And that like only certain people will have that beacon, will have that ability to influence and get information out to people. So like where I'm going with this is I see B2B influencers having like the same type of boom that B2C influencers had at the dawn of Instagram right? Which is people going to them because like in, at very B2C at the very core level, it's like, oh, she looks good. I like her style. I'm going to follow her and get style recommendations from her. <laughs> that, that's yeah. kind of what in the core at the core level, right? B2B, we haven't really seen that. And dude, to be honest with you, like it's almost frustrating to me because I have this training program where we've trained over 5,000 paying SEO agencies in the last paying SEO agencies for the lowest pr program we have is 3000 bucks. So we're talking about people that have paid us a lot of money. And when people pay you a lot of money, they trust you. They like you. They, they, they want to learn and kind of whatever I've recommended them, they'll take. So I recommended them the basic tools that we use, but I've reached out to these tools to be like, yo, like I want to do an exclusive partnership with you to the community. And they're like, ah, we don't really see the value in that. We don't really have the budget for it. Like, meanwhile, they're doing all this garbage marketing and like paying all these people who are doing nothing for them. So it's kind of frustrating, but I do think that it will, you know, our hard work will pay off in the future because they're going to come back and be like, yo, like we can't reach new people anymore in three yeah. years from now because search is dead for content. Like nobody's going to Google anymore and searching for like 
best CRM because it's all written by machines and people don't want to do that. They want to learn from humans. So long-winded answer of just saying that, like, I think B2B quote unquote influencers, not that I see myself as an influencer, but like I am working on building that following in those communities because we're moving off of already a heavy reliance on paid ads to sell people instead of paid ads to build community and then selling the community. So you can call it like yeah. social selling, whatever, but like getting people into a space where their guards are down because we're providing value to them, they trust us. And then we make offers to them based on, you know, what they elect and what they raise their hands for. So communities have been like a key part of not just generating some recurring revenue for us, but also to upsell like our more high value programs that are five, 10, $15,000, you know? So the concept is, is not, it's not new and it's not, but I just, I think that it's going to become increasingly, increasingly important for B2B organizations, especially these brands that are just like, so out of touch, dude, they just don't know how to like, they just have like no, just personality, nothing. They're just run by dweebs, I guess. I don't know. They just don't know how to connect with a human, you know? And I think it's only going to get worse as like AI just takes over that. It's like, you got to have somebody who can do that, who can communicate, who can build a relationship with people who like look at their own mom. I'm like, yeah, like. I like this guy or girl, like they know what they're talking about. Like, I want to follow them. I want to learn from them, you know? So. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We spoke to someone a couple of days ago and he was championing founder led marketing, where it's like having that person who is that spokesperson, or if you don't, and you're the quiet technical kind of person, you need a co-founder who will be that spokesperson for you. Like you need to be forward facing, build that rapport rather than, you know. Or hire um, someone like a trusted with Sam. Oh, that's a great example of somebody who yeah. like they brought in the student, like he's a, he's great on video. He's done a tremendous job. He's brought in their YouTube channel, like hundreds of thousands of subscribers. Like a has really a great, done a great job with their marketing, but at the same time, like I'm not picking on them, but I saw this as another company that I saw, I won't name them, but like they're looking for a video person and they're paying like 500 bucks a video. And like people have, they have all the time. They're like, we want to sponsor video on your channel. I'm like, cool. It starts at $10,000 and they're like, yeah. that's too much. I'm like, no, it's not <laughs> Yeah, like, yeah, you are with me building this effing channel for the last eight years. Like, you know, how hard it is to get followers in the B2B space. You know how many videos I've created, you know how many hours I put into this? Like, no, yeah. like if you want to get on my channel where I make no recommendations, it starts at $10,000 and that's just for me to make the video and publish it. You want to use it for ads too. Like, and this is why I get frustrated with these companies because they don't know what they're doing. It's like, that's a steal. If I see a channel like mine, that's like got 50,000 subscribers and never makes product recommendations, I'm all in. I'm like, yo, Ryan, like we want to be the exclusive partner with you. And we want to do it in a way that like, isn't putting banners everywhere, but like, just use our product. Like you're already kind of using it. Like just use our product. And like, yeah. then we can do some ads cut up with that. And we can do like, like they're just so bad. <laughs> they're yeah. so bad at marketing and they don't get it that like they spend all this stupid money on like events that like in like webinars that like eight people show up to. You know, and I'm yeah. like, this is stupid, guys. This is a waste of time. Like, they're boring. Nobody wants to see a presentation on keyword research anymore. Like, do something different. Like, invest in something that's different. Stand out. Like, you see it working with other companies, and people come to me like, we want to do what HRS does. I'm like, cool. This is what's going to cost. They're like, no, it's not worth it. I'm like, okay, that's why you're like, that's why you're not going to make it. Dude. Like, yeah, it's it, it's mind blowing how like copycat the industry is, and how. They just don't like, like they want to do it, but they're just so they just like don't understand how to allocate resources to marketing. I don't know. It's a, it's a frustration point of mine. I can go on that about all day. I think before anyone should be able to negotiate on a price of producing a video, be that YouTube or anything else, they should have to do one themselves, be that scripting it, yeah. you know, filming it, editing it, refining it, and then all of that. Cause Jesus, it's not, it's not easy. Like after you do that, you realize like it's a skill. Yeah. Try and get more than like eight like, people to watch your video. Like it's. Yeah. It's that, and that's the hard part as well. Yeah. Yeah. So like the first bit is making a good video. The second bit is getting people to watch it. So yeah, not easy. Perfect. Was there, was there anything we've not covered today that you wanted to go through or are you all good? There? No, I think we're good. I have a quick announcement. Nice. If any, anyone in the SEO space, we just launched a called traffic projection tool. It helps you forecast yes. SEO. It's built for SEO sales teams. Really dope. Trafficprojection.com. It's the only plug I have. Uh, definitely nice. check it out. All good. All good. And how can people stay up to date and follow you along? Best place LinkedIn or? LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, just Ryan Stewart across the board. You can find me. Nice. Perfect. All right, Ryan, thank you. Appreciate your time and for everybody listening. So thank you for tuning in. This has been Bite Size B2B Marketing. You can find our page on LinkedIn and on all good podcast platforms. So catch you all next week. Thanks, Steve.